American. Fight for what's right. Fight for your life. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode nine of the Ron and Brian podcast. I am Ron, and as always, joined by the George to my Martha, Brian. How are we doing on this 4th of July, Brian? I am doing splendid. Uh, it is, uh, it's a day that, uh, it's a day that makes me realize exactly everything that I cherish, which is America, grilling, and people wearing the American flag as clothing, uh, covering different parts of their body, and uh, just people sitting there saying, you know what, this country, you know, we may not be number one in education, we may not be number one in economic growth, but we are still number one. And we are number one. And you know what else is, uh, is number one? Your drink of the week selection. So kudos to you, my friend coming back strong it wasn't even close no like the week before i believe my drink won by by a single vote um this was this was just a blowout i believe it was 75 percent to 25 percent a, a mandate from the people if you will yes i think at this point i believe you need to step down uh <laughs> i i think that the, the i mean the people have spoken they have rejected right. they've rejected your uh your contribution to this uh this platform and i think it's time for you to step down and uh allow your successor to uh to to to, ha to have a, a vote all right well and the winning drink is a mai tai take take a look at mine sir how do you like the look of that it looks does it look on point this week does it absolutely look... i think it looks right, very fantastic. similar to mine how did you make yes, yours how did you make uh, yours so a uh, shot of coconut rum, shot of spiced rum, uh, grenadine, orange juice, pineapple juice, ice, shake, serve. I did the exact same thing <sighs> with the exception of I took out the coconut rum because I absolutely despise the uh, taste of coconut. So I just went with two shots of uh, dark rum. So what I'm hearing is uh, you didn't follow the recipe that you yourself supplied for your drink of the week. Oh, I ronned this bitch. Mm. It's sad. It's sad, really. And it's it's reflective of the state of this country. You just mailed it in, my friend. Oh, I didn't mail it in. I made a Mai Tai. I just made a my Mai Tai. Oh, yes, yes. I Though I do want to point out, I was a little disappointed that you didn't put up more of a struggle for uh, gaining support on your kamikaze. I will say this. Uh, two, two errors, I believe, I made. Number one, uh, just the selection of the drink itself. Uh, you know, looking back in hindsight, the kamikaze is more of a shot, less of a drink. And I think that's where... There, there was a bit of negativity. And also, I, uh, I did not get around to doing my campaign ad um, or any propaganda this week. So, um, you know, I, I deserve the loss that you handed me. I, w I was looking forward to you doing the campaign ad. Uh, I was, in terms of tracking the votes, obviously, I was very eagerly uh, in tune with what was going on after having lost the Moscow mule to your French 77, which was quite possibly the worst thing I've ever tasted. Um, it's, it's up there, yes. And what I wanted to, uh, so this week I really wanted to, to just, you know, put a, a full press effort to make sure my Mai Tai won. And I got off to the early lead and I held it. I, I literally had videos of kamikaze fighters um, crashing into U.S. Navy destroyers in the World War II Pacific campaign, which I was all set to shame you with. And it turned out I didn't need to. Like, I literally had you as a um, 
as someone who was uh, uh, fighting the internment camps back in World War II. I had you being someone who supplied the Japanese with the uh, aerial maps of Pearl Harbor so they would know where to bomb. I mean, I, I had all these different arguments to make, and it turned out to be moot. In a way, I'm, now I'm kind of disappointed that I did not put up more of a fight, and, and I will try and do better in the coming week, so... I am going to teach myself Photoshop because I needed to take a white <laughs> bandana and Photoshop that over your forehead. Okay. Uh, so this, and maybe even uh, 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 super uh, impose your face into a Japanese fighter plane from World War II to say, on his way to go kill Americans, Ron Bailey's son um, is uh, supporting his kamikaze. I'm, again, uh, disappointed I didn't do more uh, because you were clearly prepared for the win. Now I feel I may have lulled you into a little false sense of security for next week, but well, but we shall see. I think the key is to make sure that you do not ever uh, recommend a drink that requires the St. Germain elderflower liqueur. Oh, it's coming back. I, I'm just warning you. I promise you I will... Um, and I, I obviously this is something that the fans have are, are not aware of, but I will be visiting you um, yes. at the end of this month. I will be bringing my bottle of Saint Germain down, and um, <laughs> I will be pouring it into everything you have in your refrigerator. So when you go to put your creamer in your coffee, there will be elderflower liqueur in. When you decide to have your glass of orange juice, elderflower liqueur flavored orange juice you'll be having. Um, it's. Uh, it's going to happen. Well, another elderflower drink selection is coming. It may not be next week. It may not be next month. It may not be next year. But I will return with the St. Germain just to bust your stones like that. I, I appreciate it. One of the things that I did like that we have done for two weeks in a row is our drinks of the week have been similarly themed where the you know two weeks ago we had French seventy seven versus the Moscow Mule, so it was foreign countries. This week was a Asian themed uh, beverage. It was. And I th I would like to see if it's possible for us to maintain doing something like that. We can certainly try, even if it's just um, uh, using the same uh, alcohol. At, like we agree, let's do a tequila based drink. And then we put two, but I think I'd, I'd like to see that we um, uh, do something similar so I can make sure that I never say, hey, let's do a St. Germain flavor drink. <laughs> and, and I can always say, you know, it can always be a mixer into something else. So we'll see. I think this needs to keep evolving because if nothing else, um, my bar is becoming very well stocked with mixers, alcohols, the whole nine yards. It's, it's, it's top shelf. I had to go out and buy a, a, a second bar because it's... And that's it, dedication. Yes. I don't think people understand how dedicated you are to this show. Before we started doing this podcast, Ron, I had uh, Jack Daniel whiskey, I had scotch, and I had vodka. And now I find myself looking at my bar with uh, grenadine. Uh, uh, by the way, seriously speaking, as an aside, am I supposed to put the grenadine in the refrigerator or does it stay outside? You know, that is one of the great questions. Where's yours? Uh, mine is out right now, but I just opened a new bottle. But I believe I don't know that you need to to refrigerate it. I, think. I didn't. I haven't been refrigerating. I wasn't yeah, planning I think it on can it. Stay out. So now I have grenadine. I've got. Uh, I now have uh, rum. I've got tequila. I've got uh, the elderflower uh, poison, um, <laughs> and uh, and the list just keeps growing and growing and growing. And you've just and grown. Growing. You've grown as a person. Grown as a human being. I respect that. And my liver's grown. Um, so speaking of winning, also winning this week yet again, uh, super racist, uh, Nathan Larson. Um, so we have made the decision. We said last week after after five wins, we would retire someone and, and put them into our season-ending tournament of the champions. And we're pretty tired of, of Nathan Larson, although it was a contest for a little bit. Um, Permit Patty did get a couple of votes this past week, but once again, Nathan Larson wins for the fourth time, and we're just going to retire him just so we can move on, we can get some new blood, 
get some new competition. Brian, S- thoughts? Yeah, speaking of last week, uh, we ran a poll. Uh, Nathan Larson won uh, by two-thirds of the vote to one-third to Permit Patty. For those that don't remember, Permit Patty was the CEO of a uh, marijuana edibles company that provided uh, edibles for dogs, if I remember correctly. And she, she, her, she looked like the female version of the Pillsbury Doughboy. And I say <laughs> that not in the sense of... Uh, body shaming, but more in the sense that she literally is painfully white. Like there's absolutely no features of this woman that show any level of of ethnicity other than the inside of a potato. Um, But what concerned me was that I was when I was perusing the votes for uh, for last week's uh, this week in racism, I noticed that you had uh, voted for permit patty over Nathan Larson. I had, yes. I was wondering if you had, uh, if you would like to take a moment to discuss what your logic was in saying that she, being a more of a racist than Mr. Nathan Nathan Larson, who wants to go back to neo Nazi age, where um, with with the caveat that you're allowed to sleep with your daughter. Um, you know, again, I think it's for me when we vote about this week in racism i think we part of it is we vote as to who the overall maybe worst person is um and my rationale this particular week was you know with nathan larson he's a horrible person um but he's very upfront with that and i think what bothers me more about the whole permit patty situation is you know she's someone that you know a I uh, felt it necessary to call the police uh, to, um, to to be a mediator for a situation, which which is bad enough. You're wasting the police's time when they probably could be doing something better. You know, she also is putting, you know, uh, people and an eight year old child in a dangerous situation because, you know, let's face it, we, we have a habit in this country of police shooting black people. You know, I think that's fairly indicative of what can happen a lot of times and you know for her to potentially put this child her mother other people in this situation um made her a worse person so your logic is that nathan larson is more of a theoretical racist where permit patty was more of an actual um having more of an impact on an actual human life right I, I don't see, I don't see, you know, I think, you know, running for office and writing a manifesto is the extent of the effort that Nathan Larson, that kind of person is willing to do. He's, he's going to stay in his mom's basement um, otherwise, whereas, you know, Permit Patty is someone that, you know, was, was trying to impact someone in real life. And, and that I felt was deserved of my vote this past week. I think you're wrong. No, I just think right, you're, well, you're utterly wrong. Agree I think, to disagree. I think no, 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 no. This isn't an agree to disagree. I think you're. <laughs> I think. I think your whole belief system is completely uh, misguided. That um, the uh, potential, uh, uh, the potential disturbance of one child who's trying to sell water could be compared to. Uh, someone who is looking to take us back to, and not even taking us back, but trying to take America to a uh, uh, neo-Nazi type of government where uh, women become enslaved by their their husbands, uh, daughters are enslaved by their fathers, uh, uh, minorities are uh, treated as slaves if not kicked out of the country. I think that's way more of a racist than Permit Patty. Well, again, you know, for me, I guess maybe it wasn't as much the racism. I mean, you know, if, if you just put it racism wise, yeah, he's a horrible, horrible individual. But when you just look at an overall person, who's the worst person, you know, again, I feel she was in this instance. You know, I don't while he, while Nathan Larson has his beliefs, he's got no power whatsoever to, you know, instill those beliefs and make those things happen. And Whereas, what happens when he has a daughter? Well, I mean, clearly here's a guy who should not be allowed to reproduce, should not be allowed to have children. I Again, I'm just talking in this particular instance, sizing them up week after week. That was my vote. 
Well, based on the photo that we have in our Facebook poll, Nathan Larson is not even allowed to have a decent hairline. Nor should he. Mm, I should just, he ever. I just heard you enjoy your, your, your lovely Mai Tai. It's not bad. I mean, How uh, are you I'm enjoying not, it, by the way? I'm not a huge rum guy. But okay. I will say this isn't that bad because, you know, you've got a little bit of sweetness there. The the pineapple and orange juice really offset that rum flavor. Uh, I'm enjoying it much better than the French 77. I think this drink is going to uh, uh, have a, an issue with my diabetes. Well, um, it's literally nothing but sugar. Yeah, it's all sugar. I mean, just... So keep your keep your pen your EpiPen. Is that even what you use for diabetes? No, EpiPen. EpiPen is when uh, the kids have the uh, allergic reactions. All right. Well, whatever what I you need, would no. need for your diabetes. Um, a bowl of oatmeal. All uh, right. Quaker oatmeal. No, uh, <laughs> I think what I need is my insulin shot. All right. There you go. But what I don't yes, know is do that you is the, what you would need. Do you need the insulin shot when your sugar levels goes down or when it spikes? Um, I think it's when it spikes because you need it to bring it down. I think if it's low, you just eat something sugary or something with carbs. But I don't know. But what we'll happens if you don't have this week? No, we're not going to research it. You know, and all right, I, good point. We both won't. Um, all right. So, uh, so let's. So now, first off, why have do we have our theme music for this week in racism? But of course we do. Good. Thanks to DJ and a half, we now have a little intro. To this week in racism. This week in racism. 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 And since racism. We haven't, and since we racism. Had a, a racism. Sorry. I, I actually have three racists this week. If that, if you don't think that's too much. Can we do a Facebook poll with three people with three options? I believe we can. All right, I'm going to leave that to you because I'm slightly Facebook challenged. No problem. Um, and speaking of which, if you have not already, go check out our Facebook page. Uh, it's the Ron and Brian podcast. You can find us at, at Ron and Brian uh, on Facebook, and which is where we have been uh, up to this point primarily uh, putting most of our content up. You will see all, not only all of our um all the podcasts that are issued, but you're also going to be able to find the polls for drink of the week, the polls for this week in racism. And also you will be able to find the donate money to Ron and Brian, uh, go fund me link, uh, which people, uh, have, uh, really just, I mean, the support has just been incredible. I've been moved by the the generosity um, of people, not just in America, but around the globe, just around the globe. We picked up China. Uh, we picked up additional listeners in Australia. I mean, it's just it's it's really a worldwide phenomenon now. We've got China on a board. We do. Yes. Interesting. Welcome. Uh, uh, welcome, Beijing. Shanghai. Konnichiwa. No, Konnichiwa is Japan. All right. Well. I know nothing, so I only know Konichiwa from watching Kill Bill. <laughs> Maybe that's why that you say Konichiwa like we say Konichiwa. So first up in this week in racism, we have uh, someone they're calling Raymond the racist. Uh, this involves a gentleman by the name of Amir Gusi and his brother. I probably killed that last name there, uh, but anyway, they were driving around. Uh, they were being followed by uh, a car for miles on the highway. Their car happens to have stickers of both the Afghan flag and the U.S. flag. So eventually they, they pulled over to see what the issue was. Uh, this driver that had been following them pulled over, and this was the interaction uh, that Amir was able to record. What's your problem? Fuck you, Afghanistan! What the fuck's Why your problem? Why are you such a bitch, Afghanistan? What's your problem? What's You're a problem? bitch, Afghanistan. Oh, yeah? Yeah? You're a bitch, yeah? Afghanistan. Yeah? Yeah? What's up? Oh, yeah? Oh, oh, You uh, good? Uh, you good? It's a good thing you got that to protect you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Snatch your fucking Rest in association. Nice. Out of nice. Nice. Yeah. You racist nice. fucker. You fucking eagles. Yeah, fucking yeah, idiots. yeah, yeah, yeah. Eagles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back in your Honda, you little prick. Go back. Go prick. Fucking yeah, yeah, I was born here, you bitch. Fucking bitch. Yeah, 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 Ten bitch. Fucking you fucking incest loving motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, grandma. yeah. Oh, that's us, right? You West Pretty Virginia much. motherfucker. Pretty much yeah, 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 yeah. 
All right. And again, surprisingly enough, even with the video, even with this having been viewed, uh, going on a couple, going on about a million times, I think at this point, uh, this gentleman has not yet been identified. Although I'm sure that's probably short, shortly coming. High points of that video are, for personally for me, right. is A, the, uh, the gentleman, the Afghanistani uh, gentleman who is taking the video, um, first off, is a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I Apparently. Like that. I like that. The second of all, he has the best comeback to the, uh, the white guy that is cursing at him, telling him to go back to his country when, uh, when the guy taking the video says, go back to your Honda, you little prick. And I love the fact that this guy who is supposedly so, uh, so America, so pro-America that he's just literally driving around looking for minorities to attack is driving a foreign vehicle. Like <laughs> you that think was he'd the, be driving maybe a Ford or exactly, a Chevy. Exactly. That was the thing for me that said um, that this is just a stupid racist. <laughs> um, next up, we have the North Fresno racist. Uh, this apparently involved a fender bender um, uh, between two gentlemen, uh, one of which who was uh, Hispanic, and the driver of the other car uh, apparently didn't like the fact that he was Hispanic, and so this ensued. Get the fucking police out here. What's that? Fuck, I don't know. He doesn't have a name on him. Get him out here as soon as possible. I'm in a hurry. Stupid motherfucker, man. You pay attention. You're driving, aren't you? Fucking run into a car. Sit here, park, and run into a fucking car, man. You a fucking delivery. maniac or something? Are hey, you fucking way. stupid? I'd have shipped your fucking ass back home wherever you're from. Excuse me, I'm American as much as you. Oh, okay. fuck you. Yeah. You ain't no American. Like oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a fucking beaner, you motherfucker. Really? Yeah, I'm really. Okay, what's we'll that? Oh, it's a stupid fucking Mexican out here. They don't know how to drive anyway. Are you racist or what? I'm a racist kid. You're stupid fucking ass, you big fucking buck. Sit in your park, motherfucker runs in. Here's Horn, he keeps backing up. Let's get the cops out here as soon as you can. So that fine gentleman uh, was identified as Daniel Kuhn. Kuhn? K U E H N E? Cooney? I don't know. Uh, he was the owner and CEO of RV for Less in Madera, California. Um, and then the company uh, recently said that they have, quote, relinquished all ties with him, unquote. Yeah, I would just be careful how you pronounce that name. <laughs> I mean, we are talking this week in racism, so just be careful. I don't want people to get the wrong idea and next week have to nominate you for racist of the week. And here's a guy... Uh, fender bender he you know he's on the phone uh either with his insurance company he's calling the cops he's screaming at his friend and um he just you know he just takes it right to racism i just um, like the the entitlement to like hey get the cops out here quick because i'm in a hurry like i'm sure they're gonna rush out to your fender bender with no <clears throat> no injuries well, of course. Well, the thing being is just the fact that you're an offender bender, you're white, and it's white privilege. It's right. the fact of a white person is in a car accident with a non-white, so therefore, let's make this uh, out to uh, a uh, police number one priority, which I think is, is perfectly reasonable. <laughs> and now, uh, as is rare in This Week in Racism, um, he actually went public with an apology video on his personal Facebook page. So, Brian, I'd like you to kind of score this, uh, this apology he, he put out here. I want to apologize for my actions and specifically my choice of words that stem from the traffic incident on Wednesday. I let my emotions get the better of me, and there's no excuse for that. Regardless of what caused the incident or things that were said outside of the filming of that incident, the things I said were wrong, and I apologize to any and all who were justifiably offended by my conduct. So, and it's too bad you can't really see the video there because, like, towards the end, he's he's literally looking off screen, trying to get like a thumbs up or down, like, "All right, I've said enough, and don't need to continue this apology." I don't mean from his Filipino wife. Um, <laughs> I would say first off, he it sounds like he is painfully reading this. This yes. is not something off the top of his head. And um, I think this just go. I, 
it's it's one of those things where I find, you know, people making an apology after doing something where they're really apologizing for the fact that they got caught doing right. it. No question. I don't believe that this guy is basically, you know, wholeheartedly saying, uh, you know, my behavior was was a bit horrent. This is something I, you know, that I, uh, I just can't. Um, that I, I don't know where it came from and whatnot. What he's, you know, he's really just kind of saying, um, you know, let's let's just move on. Right. Um, and then our third candidate this week um, is going to be. Pastor Michael Breeze of St. Mary's Catholic Church in Charlotte Hall, Maryland. Uh, he was uh, overseeing a funeral for Agnes Hicks. Uh, apparently someone knocked over and damaged a church chalice, and he kind of went a little bit crazy. He kicked everybody out, um, had them remove the body from the church, and then also called the police on everybody. Um, unfortunately, and, and we've, we've, we've made this critique previously, when you're shooting racism video, get good video, get good audio. And that really doesn't exist in this case. So mm. we're just going to have to rely on a local news report talking over the very bad cell phone footage that was recorded. Let me make sure I play the right one here. A cell phone records a chaotic scene from the church pews as an argument between the pastor and family laying their loved one to rest escalates while the body of 54-year-old Agnes Hicks lays in her casket right nearby. A short time later, the family is seen carrying out her casket to leave with shocked attendees and police cars in the parking lot. When officers arrived, they determined the family was not in the wrong and escorted them to a funeral home out of the county where another pastor performed their funeral service. Meanwhile, the Archdiocese of Washington has issued an apology to the family that reads in part, quote, what occurred at St. Mary's Parish does not reflect the Catholic Church's fundamental calling to respect, nor does that incident represent the pastoral approach the priests of the Archdiocese of Washington commit to undertake every day in their ministry. And so Pastor Breeze has been placed on administrative leave um, while the diocese uh, researches this further, uh, which I assume means they will wait until the news media coverage dies down and then quietly put them back into place oh if i thought one thing if there's one thing that the church is great at doing is really taking care of priests that you know break the law or do anything offensive well what they usually their their mo is to say that he you know the, it has been addressed and we have reassigned him because he clearly has lost um, you know, as punishment, we've to be, you know, he's lost the role of pastor in this church when in effect what they're basically doing is just moving, shuffling him to another church where hopefully people have not heard that this happened. Um, I just, have you seen The Keepers? I have, on Netflix? yes. Yes, an excellent documentary. Just finished watching it. Don't think it's an excellent documentary. All right. We can talk about that after This Week in Racism because <laughs> um, I felt that there were some fundamental issues with that uh, documentary, but one one of the things that that documentary deals with is uh, priests that were uh, how do I say this politely? Um, they were having a little bit more fun in a Catholic high school with the students than they should have been. Let's and um, and what happens is the stories is that as their complaints were coming in, the priests were just shuffled from an, one school to another to a different church, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and most likely, this guy is not going to be uh, uh, held to any standard whatsoever. Uh, the real question that I'm having is uh, is is the fact that why why did he lose his cool so much? I guess because whatever this chalice is, I guess there's some sort of you know I don't know if it's necessarily a sentimental value, but I guess it's meaningful. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, it wasn't, uh, it didn't seem to be very Christ-like in my opinion. No, but was this the Holy Grail? It could have been, you know, you never know. There's a lot of secrets in the church. This could be one of them. The Holy Grail could be hiding in Charlotte Hall, Maryland. And that's the thing that is uh, most concerning to me is the fact of, is this the kind of thing that we need to be aware of? I think maybe we need to do some more research. 
We'll look Which into it. Which is not something that you and I are very good at. We are not. So we we, we are not good at it. The research of others that we can look up online. Yes. Um, so that will probably be the extent of it. Okay. Um, is that all of our entries? Or Those are all three. So you'll be able to go on our Facebook page um, and vote for who you feel the new winner and champion of this week in racism should be now that we're retiring Nathan Larson. Also, I saw uh, it was a good commercial I saw online um, in relation to this week in racism. And I'd like to send this out to all the white people out there. Hi, fellow white people. Are you having a sad because that family's enjoying a picnic in the park while being black? Did that customer in front of you just speak a language that makes you irrationally angry? Well, this is a great time to try. Mind your own f***ing business. With Mind Your Own f***ing Business, you'll be able to grow the f*** up and act like a decent f***ing human being. Our patented technology allows you to pull your head out of your ass and see the world beyond the brim of your MAGA hat. Hi, honey. I saw some black people at the Starbucks today. Did you mind your own f***ing business? I sure f***ing did. <laughs> <laughs> Stop bothering those nice people today with Mind Your Own f***ing Business. Side effects may include not harassing people, no one getting arrested or murdered by police, a general sense of well-being for people of color, a lack of internet fame, and or trolling and coexistence. Please consult your doctor if you are still a piece of shit after minding your own... All right. Um, so, again, check out this Week in Racism poll on Facebook. You may be hearing some explosions in the background. That's just because my neighborhood loves America, and they're, they're getting their own fireworks uh, going off at the moment. Brian, is that something that takes place where you are? Not particularly. Not it really is a suburban thing. Very well. It. I think it's a white thing. I mean, there is that too. Though you have mentioned before that Bill Cosby does not live far from you. So just a, just a few blocks. Yes. And you can't get into the that gated community where he's in. I mean, you could if you wanted to. It's not a very high gate. Like I could probably scale it if I if I really wanted to. But. Uh, you know, we don't know if, if, if Cosby's armed or, or what he's instructed his people to do. I picture him more as a man that uses tranquilizer darts, though. Mm, well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Um, so, yeah, this is our first uh, uh, contest versus contest versus contestant in, uh, in this week in racism. Let's, uh, um, I'm interested to see how the people... Uh, where the people feel the biggest racist in this group is, and and I'll be honest with you, uh, there were more there were more examples of racism out there that we could have gone with. I mean, they they really come in quicker than you uh, you know what to do with. In fact, after I had these three set up, I saw an article about Newport Nancy, um, who apparently called the police on one of her African American neighbors because they were smoking um, in a parking garage. Ooh, you didn't even let me know about that. It, but it came we, in so late. But didn't we also have this week, uh, there was a young uh, 12-year-old African-American boy who was uh, mowing the lawns of uh, suburban families because he was trying to make money uh, operating his small uh, uh, one-man uh, army. And he was... Uh, uh, he accidentally trimmed the grass of a of the neighbor of one of the families that had hired him, and that neighbor had called the cops on him on a twelve year old boy. Yes. There was also an eighty five year old African American woman who was traveling on a church bus trip, which broke down, and being an eighty five year old woman, uh, she needed to use the bathroom, and when she went to the gas station i forgot the name of it but it was like folk f-o-l-k oil yes was it folk oil it was folk no, oil it. yes you're correct and uh she went to a uh she went to the gas station to say listen i'm about to burst can i use your bathroom she was told that the bathroom is for employees only which caused a uh the poor woman to have to uh pee in a uh, a field across the street and don't forget, there was also uh, Ron Paul uh, tweeting a uh, very racist political cartoon, which he blamed on a staff member. And then uh, Denise D'Souza, uh, that filmmaker that was recently pardoned by Donald Trump, uh, shared two tweets on his Twitter account, one with the hashtag burn the Jews 
and the other with the hashtag bring back slavery. So yeah, there is clearly never a need for uh, this week in racism stories. There's so many out there. First off, it's Dinesh. Dinesh, douchebag, whatever. Second of all, uh, I mean, clearly bring back slavery. You really, I mean, there's no excuse for not noticing that. And whoever typed that in as the hashtag originally, it's just, it's just, it's, that's just a, a terrible thing to do. The burn the Jews, though, on the other hand, is a trending um, uh, hashtag on Twitter. And what I noticed is that when I type in burn the, I noticed that Twitter always immediately gives me that um, fill in option <laughs> of Jews is listed as the first one. You know, like I'll sometimes type in burn the supermarket, um, right. <clears throat> burn the MTA, um, uh, burn my underwear that I wore yesterday. You know, like those are the hashtags I used to, I like to use on Twitter. Um, speaking of Twitter, I'd also, uh, on a, a, once again, another tangent, and this is where I think you need to hold me back yes. from my tangents is we are, um, we have a Twitter um, and people start following it. It is, uh, I believe it's um, at Ron Bryan podcast. Something on like that. Uh, on Twitter, um, it's on my phone, so I will be using it uh, uh, moving forward. Ron, I recommend you put that on your phone and start tweeting. All right, I will do what I can. We want to start interacting with people. Uh, so today is July fourth. You know what happens uh, in eight years, don't you? Hold on, T this is two thousand eighteen. So you're two thousand eighteen. So July fourth, twenty twenty six. Twenty twenty six. See if you can do the math in your head real quick. 250 years. The semi quincentennial of the United States. And there'll be a big party, my friends, right here in Philadelphia. And dictator Donald Trump will be running the show. God, that's a frightening thought. But what else I happens? Just, well, on... I just heard fireworks in the background. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of excitement going on in the neighborhood. Literally like two or three doors down. It's good and stuff. That, and that's not you farting. That's actual <laughs> fireworks going on. This is America, though. You're, you're allowed to set off fireworks. And what else happens on the 4th of July each and every year? People adopt dogs. Well, there's that, yes. What? The Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. Oh, I didn't even. Yeah, you're right. We, we, <laughs> we, we spoke about that earlier. My bad. We did. Bad. Which All has right. really become a whole thing. Like, it, it got its own hour block of coverage on ESPN 8. The Ocho. The Ocho. It actually has multiple hours because well, that's true. At, they replayed it. Because at ten o'clock this morning they had the women's show, mm -hmm. which I I thought every I thought I, I I checked ESPN this morning and I saw that they had the hot dog eating contest from twelve to one on ESPN. So I said, I'm gonna record it. I reached out to Ron, I said, let's um this could be something we could talk about. Why don't we both watch it? Uh, you seem receptive, and it was great. Then what I noticed was uh, that as the show was going on, they weren't really featuring the women's portion of the hot dog eating contest, which um, I've been watching since I was probably about 13. Uh, you're an avid follower? Avid follower of women eating hot dogs. <laughs> um, so, and the women's winner was? I don't know her name. But, Mickey uh, Sudo. Yes. Uh, she's Fifth won the last. straight win. Yes, but she still hasn't broken the record. The she has point not. Being she is, only ate 36 hot dogs. World record is still 45. I remember when I was in junior high school, I watched a video of a woman eating three different hot dogs at the same time. It was traumatic to me because no woman ever had ever tried to eat my hot dog, and I just said, maybe this will never happen to me. But the point being I'm trying to make here, people, is that I was offended that they – that ESPN really featured the men's at new, from 12 to 1 o'clock. The women's portion was relegated to ESPN 3 at 10.30. The, the other thing that was kind of frightening to me, so, so they've got the, the actual show on ESPN 2 at noon. They stop, had... stop, Ron, yes. stop calling it the actual show. Sorry. I'm making a point that this is a, as woke as we are as a society right now, we're still treating women as secondary um, uh, citizens, second class, not as important as the men. 
uh, so uh, that we should we they should be in a better time slot is what you're saying what i'm saying is that it should have been on the same channel i'm okay with the women going first okay because in all honesty if a man and a woman are approaching a door uh woman goes first that's still where we, we you know we just got to, we saw manners but but the fact that they relegated them to a secondary station it wasn't espn2 it was espn3 on a completely different uh uh, uh time slot that i felt um i felt that that was right off the bat uh sexist by i agree ESPN. with you well, and you know what was on ESPN three during the men's hot dog eating contest? I believe they ha- didn't. They have a uh, a, ch- uh, a camera solely based on Joey Chestnut, solely on Joey Chestnut, which is frightening to me that you would just want to sit there and watch somebody eat hot dogs for ten minutes straight. Because it was, I mean, just watching them jump around, it was it was difficult to watch. I Were to you? Admit. Which one did you watch? Did you watch the Joey Chestnut? Did you watch the ESPN two? I watched ESPN too. I, right. I didn't need, uh, but Joey Chestnut did win. Um, the, he's eleven a time winner in twelve years. Only lost in twenty fifteen to Matt Stoney. Um, and before, I don't know if you, if you heard if about may, the judging scandal. If I may interrupt for a moment, because before we get to, to this point, I and because we referenced earlier all of our international listeners, I think that we should explain to people the concept because i don't know that our somali listeners understand the idea of competitive eating i mean i believe that in ethiopia their version of competitive eating is three grains of rice are put on a table and there are eight children there and the competition is which uh uh which kids are going to get those three grains of rice this is the opposite of the competitive eating there this is where um a ridiculous amount of food is placed in front of people and it's a matter of how much can they eat in a certain period of time now i grew up as a kid um thinking that the hot dog eating contest was was all that it was that these were the only competitive eating contests that were going on what i my friend oh what i have I have, i have records here of other people that just astound me so uh one of the things i've learned is just how many different eating contests there are and what on earth um and 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 there's a uh they call it major league eating it is a um what sort of thinking if it's not a league it's the it's it's uh, an actual like professional league that they have sanctioned and and they it's like a major league it's like a major league people they rank eaters so so can you so tell us some of the other um, eating contests. All right. So you have uh, these. These just, I just pulled some of the records of some of the people that were competing today. You have uh, Carmen Sincati, who is the number two ranked eater in the world. Uh, a couple of his records that he has set. Uh, he ate 101 bratwurst in 10 minutes, and he also ate 61 and three quarter ears of sweet corn in 12 minutes. You have Matt Stoney, who uh, won the hot dog eating contest in 2015, number three ranked eater. Uh, 85 moon pies in eight minutes, 113 silver dollar pancakes in eight minutes. Uh, you have Richard Lefevre, the oldest competitor today at 74 years young. Uh, he holds the record for seven and three quarter pounds of huevos rancheros in 10 minutes. Um, you have Buffalo Jim Reeves, a uh, crowd favorite at the hot dog contest. He ate 13.22 pounds of watermelon in 15 minutes. And then Eric Badlands Booker, um, who is one of the few people that actually looks like is a competitive eater because the man's huge. Oh, he's uh, a big guy. He is a big, a big guy. guy. Yeah. He ate in five minutes, 25 seconds. He ate 21 baseball-sized matzo balls. Ugh. Yes. What is the – well, let's see if you know. What is the record for most bacon strips eaten oh, in five I, I, minutes? Was that 185? 182 my ah, friends i remember reading that one. Oh my god this is disgusting nine pounds of of wings of buffalo wings in 10 minutes um oh and oh here we go uh in five minutes in five minutes what is the record number of sticks of salted butter let's see if you <laughs> i can't even imagine seven. Oh, jeez 
Now keep in mind, the, I'm only up. I'm only. We're, we're only up to the bees. Like, I, like we live in a country where we are competitive with everything, and uh, we are so. What's the word I'm thinking of? Where we do everything to excess. We're so excessive. I guess is the word. That's the really word. the word I was going for. We're we're so excessive um, that uh, that it is just so disgusting. All the and these are. There's so many different things. How many, like there's uh, the record holder for cow brains, cab cakes, uh, uh, cupcakes, 72 cupcakes in six minutes. Gee, I'm sweating. Here we go. And this is this is one from uh, uh, Cool Hand Luke. Uh, Paul Newman is watching this one. The most hard-boiled eggs in eight minutes. I'll tell you, your boy Joey Chestnut owns this one. Does How he? many? Um, eight minutes, hard-boiled eight minutes. eggs. I'm going. Uh, I'm going to go 112. 141. Wow, that's impressive. It's disgusting. And Just... I remember, I remember seeing like as they were introducing some of the people today. Like one guy had done 42 dozen oysters in 12 minutes. Uh, another had done. I want to say it was like 1.3 gallons of of chili. Um, another one had eaten like 21 habanero peppers in one minute. I mean, just uh, ridiculous. So, so Joey won, and again, he initially was credited with uh, 64 hot dogs, but apparently the judges missed an entire platter that he ate. Um, so he actually won today and set a new world record with 74 hot dogs with rolls. Now, I was, was also wondering. I was also wondering if you were paying attention to the. Uh, secondary people that were up on the platform while this was going on. You talk about the, the judges or the people that were competing, but you knew you weren't going to win. I'm talking about the announcer. Oh, I'm the announcer is fantastic. About, I'm talking about the people that uh, whose job it was to bring out uh, new plates of uh, of hot dogs when those moments happened. The women I'm in talking, skimpy outfits, you mean? I, no, 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 no. There were there were normal gentlemen that were bringing oh, were they? out right. the skimpy outfits, which was you can see where I'm I'm going for a pun coming up. Um, <laughs> okay. Then there were uh, uh, they seemed to be mostly Hispanic. There did not seem to be any Indian girls, uh, uh, American, uh, Native American women. Like it all, they, most of the girls seemed to be of Hispanic descent, and it was they they were in charge of flipping the. Uh, what do you call that? The, not the scorecard. Yeah, they were flipping yeah, the scorecard. Yeah, they were card. flipping the numbers for when hot dogs were eaten. And what I noticed was that the girl that was assigned to Joey Chestnut, um, she seemed to have the largest chestnuts of any of the women <laughs> who were uh, uh, partaking in the counting of the hot dogs. Because as she would turn them, her body would jiggle um, and at different times, and I assume somebody slipped her 20 bucks to do this, but she would just jump up and down. Well, again, I mean, knowing that the entire ESPN3 channel was dedicated to Joey Chestnut, do you the think Ocho. there may have been something behind that? I don't, I, I don't know whether somebody paid her or whether she's trying to turn this into something else. Like maybe she wants to be a dancer for the local uh, Brooklyn Cyclones baseball team, which is part of the New York Mets minor league baseball system. I don't know. But she was definitely making the most of the, uh, of the screen time that she was given. This is, the, you know, it's, when you think about it, this is really the great thing about America is, you know, if I sit down and I eat you know, like 10 tacos, like I'm a glutton, but were I able to eat like 50 tacos, I'd be considered a champion. Of course, of course. And remember I think that that's time? really what makes the country great. Do you remember that time we were in Albany and you and I went to Denny's for dinner? Then we went to a bar for a couple drinks afterwards. We ended up at that strip club and I watched you eat that taco. <laughs> uh, my my memory is a little, it's a little, a little hazy. Okay. That's fine. Um, but I, I, I was amazed at the just uh, the level of um, uh, what's the word? It was just it, it, the gluttony. It, it's, it was, it's total gluttony. The, the gluttony was just so um, that's overpowering. Um, also, I, I did. I mean, and these were some of the things. Um, first off, why did they bring out that Lefevre guy 
who is in his 70s to do this. There's no way that he can compete with the Joey Chestnut. Well, there's definitely, you know, there's, I would say, you know, there's, there's probably three people that were, you know, even in the ballpark of being able to, to compete. Um, and then, you know, the rest just seem to be, you know, uh, people that are there to fill the podium. You know, because it really, I mean, frighteningly enough, like a lot of these guys seem to have like a following and seem to have like fans. And that's what seems to happen here is they, you know, they they bring in what was it, eight or ten competitors. Yeah. And like when, when you hear like most of the crowd, most of the competitors, when they did like their regional events to get there, most of them didn't even finish more than like 20 or 25 hot dogs. Right. And when when Joey Chestnut's been eating 60 plus hot dogs for the last six or seven years to win, you know, you know, they're not going to they're not going to compete. I mean, even even the guy who came in second was 11 hot dogs uh, behind Joey. And then the third place person was like 30 hot dogs behind. But again, it's it's I mean, God bless Nathan's man. They have they have found something that, you know, has become a huge event. Um, great promotion for the company. And and I don't know if it's a, a, a sad indictment on America, but it's it's certainly something I'm sure other countries look at, like many things in America right now. They look at us and say, well, what the fuck is that? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, if you look at the winner, I mean, and it gets me to talking about the MLE, which is the Major League of Eating uh, organization, is that they seem to have a... Uh, a a stranglehold over competitive eating, you know, which almost imp- which makes you wonder whether this is an American uh, phenomenon, whether this is a global phenomenon that Americans have taken over and controlled. But it also reminded me of Kobayashi. Um, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Kobayashi. No, I didn't. He- he was, was, he was the man that was we got some we got more explosions going on here. Don't worry. OK, but there was uh, uh, Takeru Kobayashi who was a uh, competitive, eater, competitive eater from Japan. He holds eight Guinness Book uh, World Records for hot dogs, meatballs, Twinkies, tacos, hamburgers, pizza, ice cream, pasta, and drinking kamikaze shots. Nice. My I, hero. Threw, I threw that last one in there. I, 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 was, I wasn't sure if you were going to learn that. But he came onto the game and basically was, he revolutionized competitive eating. He is the one who came up with the idea of dunking the hot dog buns in water before you eat them. Yes, I which if that. I rem- which I remember if I remember correctly, basically added about twenty plus hot dogs in those ten minutes. You know, just com- just utterly changing. If you look at the uh, the competition now, everybody. In, in that competition is dunking their hot dog buns. Right. Um, whereas before, people used to eat them dry. Um, and the, the, the fact that Kobayashi is no longer allowed to partake in this, t- in this event, and I think kind of adds a question, uh, an, an asterisk, a Barry Bonds-like asterisk to the type of events that are going on. And I was wondering what your thoughts were. I mean, didn't, didn't Joey Chestnut beat Kobayashi? Years ago, he was, if I remember correctly, he beat Kobayashi once. And the next year, um, Kobayashi refused to sign an exclusive contract with MLE, which basically stated that he would only um, participate in competitive eating contests that the MLE were uh, were sponsoring. And he basically wanted to say, listen, I w- am a competitive eater and I want to participate in whatever competitive eating contests uh, that I can. So therefore, I'm not going to sign this exclusive contract with you, at which point Emily turned around and said, well, then you can't participate in any of our events. So what you're saying is Big Gluttony is keeping Kobayashi down right now. What I'm saying is that it's very possible that... Um, you have got a world-class competitive eater who is not allowed to compete in world-class competitive eating events. And that's, and just, which, that's not fair. Uh, I'll no, say it. No, no, no. It, 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 rem- it made me feel, it, it, it harkens back to the day when Pete Rose was not allowed to uh, uh, take place in baseball. Is it now? Different reasons. I'm not, <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. I understand. 
Okay. But that was that was one of the things I, I thought of when watching this, which was that Kobayashi would have um, was it made me wonder what would have been the competition right now had Kobayashi been allowed to continue to participate in MLE events. So what you're saying is we need to organize a big ticket, high money pay per view event, Joey Chestnut versus Kobayashi uh, in five separate eating events. Yes. Right. Instagram Instagram needs to free the eggplant and Emily needs to free Kobayashi. All right. I have, I, have, I have no beef with that. Speaking of things that are like completely American and food related, can can we talk about cooking on high for just a quick moment? Because I, I jotted a note down here. I don't know if you had a chance to watch any of the episodes on Netflix yet. Ron, I, I, I watched one episode and I don't remember any of it. <laughs> Just kidding. I never watched any of it. So Cooking on High is a new cooking show on the Netflix, um, which basically involves two chefs going head to head, um, making something uh, with, with cannabis, something infused with cannabis. Um, I think there's like 10 of these episodes. I could only get through two of them. And they're not long episodes. They're only 15 minutes. Like, they're, they're perfectly timed for the stoner. Um, you know, and, and the, the thing is, like, they say cannabis infused, but all the, the cooks really seem to use are uh, cannabis butter and weed oil. Um, they also advertise that there are celebrity judges judging these contests. So I'm going to read out the names of the judges from the episodes that I watched. And you let me know if you recognize any of the names. So well, before, for episode, yes, before sorry. you start reading names, are these people that are are these people that are British celebrities or are these people that are genuine American celebrities? They're supposed to be American celebrities. This is shot in the States, I believe in Vermont. Everything is so supposedly is done a, with, with I medicinal you said, marijuana. So this is not a British show. To my knowledge, it is not. Okay. So episode one. The uh, the celebrity judges were rapper Mod Son and comedian uh, Ramon Rivas the second. Never and, heard of and, either. And then in episode two, uh, the judges were uh, hip hop group Warm Brew and comedian Brad Silnutzer. No, I've never heard of either of these two. Now again, I'm sure that they they probably have achieved a level of success in their business. Um, but I think when you throw the term celebrity judge out there, you should have at least a passing recognition of that person. Well, I think also it's just the fact that when you're starting off a show with celebrity uh, judges, you want to really come in full force with your top notch, your top notch people. Right. And they, they certainly did not do that out of the gate. So, you know, you, you want to put your Brad Pitt, your George Clooney's up front. You want to start with those people, then work your way up to rapper Warren Brew. Like, right. war, rappers Warren Brew, they should be fifth season, episode seven. You know, even, basically, and, when you're sitting there just being like, hey, listen, you're friends of the producers. We're going to, you know, give you a little publicity. It'll be good, but whatnot. What, you know, but if you're starting a show and you have a celebrity guest, you really want to, you know, come in full force with a top notch celebrities. Right. And like, I mean, even they, though this is a cooking show, you don't see a lot of actual cooking going on. Like, again, it's a 15 minute show. You know, they, they introduce the judges, they introduce the chefs, they talk about the strain of marijuana that they are using. Um, there is a very short video of the people actually cooking, then the judges eat the food, then they have what they call the THC break, where they can sit and let the THC work on them. But again, most of these judges are already high coming into the show. So it's really just an extension of the high they already have. Then they right. award the golden pot. Uh-huh. Double on time right there. Uh, and then they wrap it up and that's it. And just, you know, I liked the premise. Just horrible execution. Is so are you recommending this to our listeners or no? I mean, again, I think if you really want to see uh, how bad it is, I, I would say watch an episode or two. 
It this is on Netflix? You, it is on Netflix, yes. And again, okay. 15 minutes of your time. And again, you know, if you, if you disagree with me, please let me know. Feel free to, to email us or tweet at us or Facebook us. But yeah, I, I think this, the, the only show that I've seen on TV worse than this is The Proposal. What was The Proposal? That is the show that airs after The Bachelor, uh, where people literally meet for the first time and at the end of the hour... Um, get engaged. Mm. Again, sounds like something I've done. A, a horrible indictment on the state of America might All be right. one of the most depressing things I've ever seen. Well, I believe any you know right off the bat, the Bachelor, the Bachelorette, the Bachelor in Paradise, Bachelorette in Hell. Uh, you know those shows are just they 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 couldn't be worse for uh, the the message we're sending to the outside world. Just this vapid reality based. Um, I want to be popular, but I want to uh, I want to see what's going on in America. Um, you know, that's the kind of shit that just makes me feel sad. Well, and that's why, like, I mean, the, the, the Bachelor is bad enough. I think the Bachelor is actually a step up from the proposal. OK, that's how bad it is. That's fine. Oh, no, no, that's fine. The fact that you are aware of the show, know it is what scares me. Well, uh, I will say my wife is a fan of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she falls asleep on the remote and it takes me a little while to find it before I can change the channel. Got it. Speaking of things that your wife is a fan of, <laughs> I was yes. wondering if we could now transition to another topic I wanted to talk about, which was um, Ron adopts a dog. Yes. Well, not just Ron. Uh, you know, the whole family really adopts the animals into the house. Now, when you say the whole family, let's... What? Tell me about the Ron family right now. <laughs> well, now you've, um, you've mentioned your wife, so we correct. know that we know that Ron and his wife live together. Are there any other um, members of your family in uh, that house? We we had we had one dog previously. Um, and now, obviously, we have two dogs, and there may be some cats that live here as well. Now, how do the dogs get along so far? We don't know yet because uh, our dog has been staying with our in-laws. Um, you know, he kind of acts as a service dog for them. You know, they, they take care of him for us. And, you know, he's just he's a good dog. He's a guy that just he's a dog that just kind of brings sunshine into everybody's life. It's one of those so type he, dogs. So he no longer lives with you? No, he'll be back here. Fun? He'll be back here this weekend. Got it. I thought you had traded one dog for another. No, no, no. So we, we shall see how the two dogs interact, but they're both very good temperaments, and we don't anticipate there being an issue. And, and okay. this dog, you know, our, 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 our previous, our current dog, you know, has no issue with the cats. The new dog seems to like the cats as well. Everybody seems to be getting along so far. You said cats is in plural. <laughs> like I said, we do have a few cats running around the house. Okay. How well, many? We, did you want me to put a number on that? Yeah, why not? Uh, we may have six cats at this point. Six cats. Yes. Uh, what? Um, how does that happen, if I may ask? So here's how it happens. So when I when I started dating my wife years ago, um, you know, she was a cat person. She had two cats. I knew that going in. You know, when we moved in together, the two cats came with her. So we were a two cat household for a while. Um, you know, she eventually wore me down. We got to be a three cat household, um, right. you know, and, and we were fine for a few months and then she starts working on me again. And she, she brings me the, the hard luck cases that you see on the rescue organizations, Facebook pages and things like that. Like one of our cats actually had like, like a larvae sack that was growing on the side of its neck when the you know, rescue organization found it like bot flies or something like that. Like just bringing me these horrible things and saying, oh, we've got, you know, we don't have kids. We've got so much love to give. We've got a big house. Come on. So then we got to four cats <clears throat> and we made the agreement. Four cats is it. We have capped the number of cats that we can possibly have. So then we have the neighborhood feral cat that gives birth to three kittens under our back deck which we then in turn trap and try and, you know, socialize and adopt out. And we were able to do that with one. Um, we were not able to do that with the other two. You know, I used to say, oh, we've got four cats and we're fostering two kittens. Now it's like, all right, we just have, we've got six cats. And that's, that's my life now. 
what is the uh, uh, dinner time process with all of these animals, if I may ask? I mean, it's like, not, you know, the, is, the cats. Do you, just use, do you just use like a trough system, <laughs> you know, like a commercial pig farm? Do you have like six individual cat um, bowls that you feed them? Like, is there is there six different water bowls? Do they share a water bowl? Um, do they have their own? Um, I assume that there's a dining room in your house for um, that you and your wife use, as well as maybe when guests come over. Is there a separate room that you've set aside for the cats um, to uh, to eat in? Um, I mean, there is there there is a room in the house that is a quote unquote cat room. Um, that is where all of the litter boxes are. That's where all the food dishes are. That's where the water dish is, the main, the big old water dish. Um, and then the dogs have their bowls, um, you know, down in the kitchen area. And then there's a couple other water bowls there as well. Okay. So it's, it's, it's surprising. You know, we, we work hard on cleaning the house on a weekly basis to keep up with the, the fur and the mess and everything. And I think when you come down here, you'll be very surprised. You walk in the house and you'll be like, I can't believe eight animals live here. All right. Well, actually, Lord actually, knows, I don't ten. believe eight animals live here. It'll be it's the the number is actually ten. <laughs> well, yes, counting counting the two human animals. I get it. Yes. I get where you're going with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Well, no, I just I, I wanted to say that you know, um, and obviously you're not taking credit on this one, but uh, last weekend you went to a uh, charity event. Um, that was not based on spending large amounts of money to have a chef show up at your house and uh, uh, cook dinner for you. It was a charity event for a kill shelter, I thought it was. or well, So basically shelter. it was uh, it was a local uh, brewery, Moss Mill Brewing, um, and they were having a little luau event at their place. And as part of that, um, an organization called WAGS was, was set up there with uh, some of the dogs that they were trying to adopt out. And okay. um, my, my wife saw this uh, senior... Peking knees that was there, uh, nine years old, um, just fell in love with it, and again wore me down. And here we are. We've got another dog. There you go. Congratulations. I think it's so, a great thing. Rescue is uh, don't you know don't don't go to pet stores. Rescue, adopt. Don't shop. Didn't your wife rescue you? <laughs> who rescued who, Brian? Mm. You well, congratulations, me, Brian. Well, thank you. Thank congratulations. You. Congratulations, Ryan. I think it's a great thing. Uh, what else do we have to talk about? Uh, you had a celebrity run-in this past week that you wanted to talk about? I did have a celebrity run-in. I, uh, while uh, traipsing around the streets of New York City, bumped into San Antonio Spurs basketball coach Greg Popovich. Pops. Who is uh, considered one of the best uh, coaches in the NBA. And uh, I was able to uh, have a few words with him and uh, take a picture with him. It was a great moment of mine. I was walking out of a steakhouse with some friends of mine. And one in the group turned around and uh, was talking to me. And as he's turning around, he looked behind me and said, oh, my God, there's Greg Popovich. Now, I am not a gigantic NBA fan, but I know Popovich. And the thing that I know about him is that he is famously cranky. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He does not appreciate um, uh, the post-game interviews when he is asked uh, stupid questions by the media. He will very comfortably tell the media that they are asking stupid questions and end the interview. So I sat there and said to myself, now here's a man that, uh, you know, does not like being put on, uh, does not like, uh, you know, uh, you know, things not going the way he wants them to. So how should I handle this situation? Well, listeners of the Ron and Brian, I will be happy to tell you that due to the um, two beers I had, the two dirty martinis that I had, the two scotches that I had, plus a glass and a half of wine nice. with dinner. That's a nice mix. I decided that Greg Popovich would love to meet me and hear my opinions of him before I asked to take a picture of him. And I'll tell you, the man was a true gentleman. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I was blowing smoke up his ass the entire time. Um, 
he was walking into a restaurant, not where I was, not after the one I had eaten at. He was at a, a nearby one, um, and he was walking in with a younger woman. I uh, uh, m- once my friend pointed him out. I, I immediately turned around, walked back, and I said Popovich, and he turned with a big smile on his face. And I said, "Listen, I'm a big fan. You know, I I love the fact that you tell it the way it is, and I like the fact that you speak truth. That what you say is something that's that that is truthful to you. It's not something that is going to be a good soundbite. It's not something that ESPN wants to hear. It's something that it's that you feel and you feel the world should hear. And I respect you a lot for that." At which point um, he seemed to say, uh, hey, get this drunk asshole away from me. (laughs) Um, But the words that came out were, hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. By the way, um, this is my daughter, you know, uh, uh, and he gave me her name. And I said, oh, nice to meet you. Um, I then asked for a photo and uh, he uh, took a smile uh, uh, immediately over his face. And we took a photo and I moved on. There you go. Uh, Will Greg Popovich's uh, daughter be wife number three? I I'm going to hope that um, he is a man of, of enough honor that that was actually his daughter. We can only hope. And then you had another celebrity run in also, didn't you? Not necessarily a run in. Not a run in, of, but you were uh, in the vicinity. I, met, but I went to go to a taping of uh, a comedy show this past weekend at the Village Underground in New York City, where. Um, it was Jeffrey Ross and David Tell were taping a show. One of the shows that's coming up on Comedy Central is the uh, roast of Bruce Willis, which is, as always, hosted by Jeffrey Ross or organized by the uh, Ross master himself, Jeffrey Ross. So while the show was going on, um, as uh, uh, Jeffrey Ross was getting into the audience and pointing people out, uh, I turned around and I saw that none other than Bruce Willis, um, uh, Detective John McClane, as 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 I grew up uh, worshiping him, Bruce Willis was in the house, and uh, I would say no more than about twenty feet from where I was sitting. And uh, Jeff uh, at one point walked over to him, started asking him some questions. Bruce Willis played his harmonica, and uh, I hope it makes the uh, taping. Did uh. Did he turn around and say anything like, welcome to the party, pal? Oh, I would have loved for something like that to happen, yet it didn't. Um, he uh, mumbled some incoherent comments. Um, I, don't, I don't believe he was drinking or anything, but when Jeff, uh, Jeff Ross uh, approached him and asked him questions, his answers just were rambling and nonsensical, at which point Jeffrey Ross, being the, the great master that he is, took out a harmonica and said, hey, I got a harmonica for you. you know, would you like to play a little bit of it? At which point, uh, Bruce Willis immediately busted out on it. Um, really was very impressive, uh, the skills. And uh, who knew that uh, Bruce Willis could blow like that? And uh, next thing you know, uh, it was a, a classic moment. As soon as the show was over, he was out the door immediately. So you're saying you don't have the uh, the Bruce Willis CD, The Return of Bruno, in your collection from years ago? I do not. Uh, truly missing out. Sorry. Well, now, one thing I will say about Jeff Ross, Jeff Ross will make any show that he's on better. Yes, absolutely. Case absolutely. in point, years ago when Charlie Sheen was going through his uh, little tiger blood phase there, prior to the HIV phase, um, when he was doing his, uh, his, uh, his one-man shows across the country, I yes. was one of the people that thought it would be a good idea to get tickets um, to his show in Atlantic City. Get out of here. Yeah. How and, was it? Well, I will say this, like, and, and I had heard from the reviews that it was just a, a train wreck. So I went in expecting a train wreck. So, um, you know, you're there, you're in Atlantic City. Um, the great thing is, like, you know, he clearly didn't fill the room. So they're giving free tickets out to all the high rollers at the casino. And so you've got all of these senior citizens coming to this show who are like oh charlie sheen two and a half men no idea what they're about to see with the porn stars and everything else so i would say he comes out he is funny for 90 seconds and charlie then, sheen charlie is. sheen okay and what then, was his what was his humor like what was what was funny about what he was doing he's like you know he's making he was making fun of himself a little bit about some of the interviews he had done and 
you know, they were winning and Tiger Blood and like the stuff, you know, going back to the classics, the stuff that we really wanted to hear. And then he just starts telling the most uninteresting stories in the world for like another 10 minutes. People are getting up. People are leaving. I'm sitting there like, this is going to go downhill quick. I'm loving it. Like It's kind of like watching a car wreck in, in action. And then he says, oh, he's like, well, I've got someone local who, who agreed to come out and, and work with me here tonight. And so Jeff Ross comes out and does the next 50 minutes of the show with him and just completely saved the entire night. Like, it, it would have, like, I certainly would have, I mean, I would have left early had he not came out and just again a great great talent i see his uh, roast battles are coming back at the end of the month also on comedy yep. central always fun and yeah i'll be checking out the roast of uh, bruce willis with uh, the apparently the head of the roast the roast master for that one is joseph gordon levin what is his connection with bruce willis if i may ask uh, they were in looper together oh a movie most people have not seen correct uh, I'm trying to think what other celebrities they have coming in for that. They have uh, oh, who is the one he was on Moonlighting with? Sybil Shepherd. She that should be fun. Is still alive because um, they supposedly hated each other on set. Exactly, and surprisingly, I mean, maybe not surprisingly, Kevin Smith was not invited, even though they worked on uh, Live or Die, Live and Die Free, and Cop Out. Uh, but apparently, I'm, they hate each other also. I was going to, from if I remember correctly, um, Kevin Smith said that Bruce Willis was the most difficult um, person he's ever worked with in all the movies he's ever done. Yes. I feel Cop Out was a very underrated movie, though. It wasn't very good, but it was better than the, um, than a lot of movies in that genre of, you know, just, it's not that funny, it's not that good, we've got a couple you know, um, A-list celebrities that are going to do it. So, you know, it'll be good enough. If nothing else, it was worth um, it was worth going to see for Tracy Morgan. Tracy Morgan was great in it. Yeah. Absolutely. No question. Absolutely. What else do we have? I feel like we're winding down. We, uh, we were going to talk about some celebrities that we lost in the past week. Absolutely. The one, uh, let's, well, how do I say this? Joe Jackson. Yes. The patriarch of the Jackson family. Passed away this week after um, a, uh, a long, long, lustrous life of beating the, just the daylights out of his children. Um, they never really said that he beat his wife, but he beat his children a lot, allegedly. Right. Allegedly. Not, not that he's around to sue me anymore, so I can just say it. I mean, I, don't, I have no reason to believe it's true or not true, um, but he's not here to defend himself. So Joe Jackson beat his kids. Um, <laughs> And uh, and now Tito he has even less direction in his career, which I feel bad for. And the one thing I, I heard that was interesting is apparently Paris Jackson avoided Janet Jackson at the uh, at the funeral luncheon. Really? Hey, I don't know why that is, but just well, just I wanted to share. I believe after Michael Jackson died, there was a lot of. Um, uh, inner workings within the family of who was going to be in charge of the kids and the Michael Jackson estate. Everybody wanted to be in charge of that kind of money. And um, I wanted to uh, be in charge of it. I wanted to be in charge of blanket. <laughs> blanket. <right>. Anyway. <laughs> Anywho. I feel like we're winding down. Almost. I did want to talk about, speaking of, of podcasts, since we, since we do a podcast, um, is that apparently uh, Stuttering John Melendez, formerly of uh, the Howard Stern Show, somehow managed to get a call back from uh, President Donald Trump, uh, which he recorded on his podcast. He was now, pretending he... to be Senator Bob Menendez, a Democrat from New Jersey um, called the the White House switchboard, pretending to be an aide for the New Jersey ser uh, senator. And after several rounds of messages, um, the president actually returned uh, stuttering John's phone call. Um, now, I have a question for you. Yes. Did um, at any point he admit to Donald Trump that he was stuttering John Melendez from Howard Stern? Not during the call. No. OK. So the entire call, he was pretend he continued to pretend to be the the senator. Correct. I'd also like to point out that the senator was um, 
uh, arrested and charged with uh, multiple ethics violations. Yes. So we're not. He, he didn't even go for a well-meaning uh, senator. He went after. Uh, he pretended to be a scumbag senator to begin with. Well, um, and, and Trump even said, "You know, oh, you went through a tough, tough situation, and I don't think a very fair situation." But congratulations. Has he released that podcast? Uh, I believe he has. Yes, I believe that is on his most recent uh, his most recent episode of the Stuttering John podcast. Now, when you're done listening to this and you vote for Racist of the Week and you vote for Drink of the Week, if you still have free time, um, feel free to listen to that podcast, but only after you've completed the full uh, listener experience of uh, the Ron and Brian podcast. Yes. And well, I think this, this just speaks to the ineptitude of uh, what's going on in the White House. Yes. Uh, both from the top on down. I mean, and even, you know, the, the White House official, um, you know, confirmed uh, that it was actually happened. Um, and, uh, you know, the White House apparently is scrambling, figuring out how exactly it happened. Uh, the reason it happens is you've got a lot of, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Inexperienced, unprofessional, um, uh, unqualified uh, should I continue or uh, did I cover it? Up? All those. And yeah. so, you know, the fact that these are the same people communicating with world leaders, communicating with other countries, communicating with various agencies. It's it's a sad day in America. That's all I got to say. It's sad. It's sad. I, I know one of the things we had talked about that we wanted to do was a state of America. And I don't think we're going to get to it this week. Probably not this week. But I think we should. And I think that's that's. That addresses one of the issues that we we were going to talk about, which is the state of America. And I think we are dealing with a um, a culture of ineptitude that we have kind of allowed to slide into the mainstream. Agreed. Now, you had also. Mentioned, yes, I did want to say that I don't care about LeBron. James. <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to mention that uh, yeah, LeBron James care. signed some ridiculous free agent contract with the Los Angeles Lakers this past year or past week um, joining him as Lance Stevenson um, I know people in Philadelphia are a little disappointed uh, they were hoping that he would come into the Sixers that however has not happened you Point I know being, don't really care don't care don't uh, care yeah the way I see it is the fact that it's there you know it's a sport that you sign contracts for a period of time at the end of those contracts you can go to whatever team you want to go to he has chosen to go to this team and next year um that he will be playing on that team that is my level of interest all right fair enough like i'll follow sports during the season i do not understand the fascination of continuing to talk about it during the off season i mean right now it's all about the new york yankees Personally. Oh, of course. Of course. It's all about the Yankees. Um, what are we thinking about drink of the week for next week? Um, Any ideas? I'm going to have to put some thought into this. Um, like I here. said, I, I need to come strong. You know, I'm, I'll be, my wounds, they hurt. They hurt. It was, it was, I got my ass handed to me this week. There's no other way around it. Um, this is true. So I need to think out a good drink. Uh, my wife has been accusing us of uh, old drinks, old man drinks that we've been uh, putting up there. So maybe, we're in our mid forties. What are we going to put up? I mean, uh, maybe something that a twelve-year-old girl. Maybe I need to speak to the kids out there. Find out what what the hip kids are drinking. Although I think isn't that like four loco or? No, uh, they're drinking beer that's been slid through the uh, ass crack of uh, of their fraternity members. All right. I'm not drinking that. No, you're not. No. What if What if I put that up for drink of the week? I'm not going to be drinking a butt luge. Fraternity ass beer. I think that's, I, I might have to go with that. I'll get back to you on that. No, no. And uh, <laughs> no, no. Thank you. All right. Well, happy 4th of July to everybody out there. Do not be uh, free. Do not Jason Pierre Paul yourself with your fireworks this year. Um, Did you see that he released um, photos today? Oh, or yeah. That you saw the photos oh, yeah. of the hand oh, after was, he had blown it up. Oh, it was horrible. <gasps> Fucking terrible. Like, I won't go near a firework ever again. No, not at all. It just doesn't even seem, uh, it doesn't even make sense. Like, I don't even feel safe with the fireworks being, like, two doors down. Like, they could fly through a window and take my finger yeah, of off. of course. Of course, of course. It makes no sense. So, anyway, but as always, have a great week, Ron. You too. Um, I look forward to uh, us talking um, uh, next week. Um, just to see if you uh, are aware of this one. 
Um, what is the record for the most pounds of spam eaten directly from the can in 12 minutes? Well, I believe uh, that was also, um, hold on, that record was also set by uh, Richard Lefevre. Am I correct? Yes, you and are correct. it was six pounds? Oh, yes, you are correct. Nailed it! See, I, I do my research, my friend. I was fascinated. I will probably, once this show is done, I'll probably go back on the, the Major League Eating website and look up more of these ridiculous records. Uh, I'm on right now. Records. Record for pulled pork in uh, 10 minutes. I read it. I want to say it's like 14 pounds. No, 9 pounds, 6 ounces. Oh. Well, I can put down 14 pounds, so maybe I need to go for that record. Joey Chestnut. Does Joey Chestnut have a job outside of this? I, I mean, I don't think so. I think they make enough money... Uh, between really? competitions and, and eating and whatnot. And we, I mean, we haven't even really touched on Wing Bowl, which we will need to discuss at some point because that is a, that is That's a, a Philadelphia thing. staple. Ronald, um, let me know when it's taking place next, and uh, you and I will do it. Oh, it, it always takes place right before the Super Bowl. It's, it's the Friday before the Super Bowl, and it All is right. an absolute fucking train wreck. Uh, yes, we may, we may have go. to attend that. We may have to I think that. so. I think we have to. You know what we'll do, even for that one? I will buy a portable recorder, a uh, microphone, and we will walk around interviewing people. There you go. How does that work? That works. Well, you can do it where really just with your phone. That's how high tech these things are. No, I, I want to be that guy with the microphone right. where I can be like, "So, how many uh, wings have you eaten, sir?" And then like, and move it over. Get one of those obnoxious, like bright red um, uh, uh, wind uh, protectors over the microphone. We'll see. All right, guys, can we thank get like you the so mustard colored sports coat with like Ron and Brian podcast patches, like the old ABC Sports mustard? You're speaking my language. I, my I like friends. where this is headed. All right. Well, it. you all have a good week. Again, follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Um, follow us down the street if you happen to see us. Email us at Ron and Brian Podcast at gmail.com. Vote Drink of the Week. Vote This Week in Racism. But have a great week. Brian, sir, as always, it was great doing the show with you. Always. Always.